word and if you remember from this morning a quick refresher Cornelius Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 was what he was a Roman army officer wasn't he Cornelius was a Roman <clears throat> army officer and he was a captain of an Italian regiment. He had many, many men under him. Devout, devout, God-fearing man. As with everyone in his household. But he knew nothing of the Lord Jesus for salvation. And we talked about a little bit about that this morning. Remember that we all know those that, that are devout people. Moral people, upright people, maybe those that come to church each and every week, but know nothing of the Lord Jesus for salvation. He would be approached by an angel who would give him direction as to which way he's supposed to go next in Acts chapter 10 that happened about verse 3 and 4. It would startle him. It would strike him with fear. He would be in much fear by this angel like we said this morning also. It's interesting we live in a day and time today where, where people talk about angels as if it's no big deal but yet in scripture when a man or a woman was approached by an angel it struck fear in them for the most part. He feared it. The angel tells Cornelius to go look for one man by the name of Simon Peter. And Simon Peter would be staying with another man by the name of Simon who was a tanner. Now a tanner, Simon who was a tanner, was he was living near the seashore and Peter, a devout Jew, really to a lot of people had no business staying with Simon Tanner because Simon the Tanner was involved in what? He was involved in, in the trading hides of animals and that nasty, filthy job which was against the Jewish law. and Not to mention who he was in particular. And here you have Simon Peter staying with him. So he does, he sends out a few men, he sends out, Cornelius does, he sends out three men, sends out a leading man, somebody who is faithful to him, to go find this one Simon the Tanner. He finds him, and he finds him in the land near Joppa, or in Joppa. Peter is there with him in Acts chapter 10. And before, as all this is going on, Peter himself one day is is struck with hunger and he goes up to the top of a rooftop and, and he's, he falls into a trance and he, and he, he, has, this, he has this dream of a, of a sheet falling down and there's all kind of animals going on in this sheet. And the Holy Spirit says to him or the Lord God says to him about these animals in the sheet, go and eat them and Peter says, no, I will not eat that which is unclean. And then the Lord God says, nothing is unclean if I've made it clean. And this ties back into Leviticus. We've been in Leviticus the last few weeks. And it ties back into Leviticus where at the beginning of Leviticus where the Lord God made animals clean, some unclean. And this was for the benefit of Israel as they would eventually go into the promised land and be around a bunch of, bunch of people that were not believers. And this would separate them. But now as Christ has come, as Christ has come for the redemption of mankind, we know what... That, that all that has ended, it's all now what? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no more unclean and clean animals. There's no more of that. There's no more living that way. And there's no more differentiating between the Jew and the Gentile. For Jesus Christ come to save what? The Jew and the Gentile, right? Amen. He come to save them both. 
But this is early on. I mean, we some 2,000 some years later as far as after Christ died, we're on this side of it. But you can imagine this is still a learning curve for Peter. This is still a learning curve for the Jewish believers that were new at this time. They're still struggling with this. Some of them are still sitting back in the way of the Jewish laws of the Old Testament. They don't quite get it. And that takes us, that's pretty much a rocket tour of Acts chapter 10. That takes us to Acts chapter 11. But before we go there, there's a passage of Scripture in verse 45 of Acts chapter 10. It says this, it says in verse 45, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many came to Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Jewish believers who came with Peter, who were with Peter, when he talked to, to Cornelius, and those with Cornelius were amazed that the gift of the Holy Ghost had been poured out unto the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Peter's response, can anyone object? He says to being baptized in verse 47, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So Peter's response was this. Can anybody reject, can anybody respond to what the Lord God has willed to happen? And even Peter's having to learn this. It's not far along since he's had his dream. Okay? With the animals. That takes us to Acts chapter 11. And it says in this, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So soon the news reaches the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles have received the word of God. Okay, so now news gets back. News gets back to, to, to the apostles and other believers in Judea, to the other Jews, that the Gentiles have been receiving the word of God. Peter was come up to Jerusalem that they were of the circumcision contended with him. In other words, but now that Jesus, when Peter arrives back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticize him. How dare you, basically what they say in verse 3, thou wentest into the men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. But what they're saying is, how dare you enter into the home of Gentiles and even eat with them, they said. You see what's happening you see what's happening with the crucifixion, with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection. The veil is torn. Everything is changed, okay? Man can now go to the Father but through Christ. There's no clean and unclean animals anymore. The Jew as well as the Greek, the Gentile, can all have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ if they believe in Him for salvation. All this is changing. It's all changing towards and it's all pointing towards the glory of Christ, isn't it? But some of these believers early on, Jewish believers, were having trouble with it. They didn't quite get it. They didn't quite understand it. You know, it's the same thing today, but in a different day and time. Yeah, you look at it a little bit differently. Every now and then you'll bump into somebody that knows somebody that's come to faith and they just can't believe they've come to faith. I don't know it's a different avenue is where I'm going with this, but they just can't believe they've come to faith. How dare the Lord save them? I know somebody personally whose family is just in an uproar because they just can't believe the Lord would bless him like they do, like he does. They just can't believe he's come to faith knowing his past life. But that's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Amen. That's his grace. That's who he is. He's a saving God 
that not only looks to the Jew, but looks to the Gentile, to every man from every nation, and salvation is offered, is it not? It's offered. But like then, as it is today, people still, what? Don't like it. They don't like it. I remember when hearing about the testimony of Charles Tex Watson many years ago when he come to faith, the guy who followed uh, Charles Manson pretty close. And when he, Charles Tex Watson come to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there was you know there was doubt about it. People questioned, "How dare can this God forgive this man who who committed such a horrendous act?" You know of. Of, of, of murder of, of people and how, it just can't be but yet what Christ's power to forgive supersedes man's sinfulness right it's the same thing even in Acts when Paul come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ what was the response when he was Saul when he was named Saul what was the response to from some of those people that heard that Saul who's Paul that heard that he come to faith a lot of them didn't believe it and a lot of them would not accept it would they Amen. It's a little bit different but sort of the same thing here in Acts chapter 11 some new believers, new Jewish believers in Judea cannot believe, will not accept that the Gentiles are receiving the Word of God. They don't like it. They don't like it. It cuts against the grain of their thinking. It cuts against the grain of the way they think things need to be, the way they think things need to go. The churches could alleviate a lot of their problems today if they would just quit thinking about the and wanting the way they think things need to go in the church and just and just abide the church and lead the church according to the way what Scripture has to say. Same thing then, same thing today, just a different day, just a different time. So they wrath out a little bit. They criticize Peter in 11.2. 11.3. They criticize him for entering the house of Gentiles and even eating with them. I mean, it's bad enough. It's bad enough for, for, a, for a Jew to walk into a Gentile's house. Oh, it's bad enough. But now you're going to walk into his house and you're going to sit on the floor and eat with the family. Have you lost your mind, Peter? Mercy triumphs. You're exactly right, Janie. Mer Janet. Mercy triumphs, doesn't it? And Peter here is going to tell them about mercy. He's going to tell them about grace. That comes through who? Peter? No. That comes through the Lord Jesus. And in verse 4 it says this, But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend, and as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fasted my eyes, I considered it and saw four footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord. There you go, Peter. But not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, thou call not thou common. So Peter gives a little explanation to the believers that are there. He says, Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened to me. Let me give you a testimony to what happened to me. I mean, you could stop right there, and you can ask you. I mean, you could stop right there when you're talking to a to an unbeliever, or when you're even talking to a believer out in the world. What testimony do you have to give them? What do you have to tell them? Peter's giving them a testimony about what he went through, isn't he? Amen. Give them a testimony. Tells them exactly what happened. I was in the town of Joppa. He said. 
paraphrasing, I was praying, I went into a trance and I saw a vision. It's like a large sheet was let down. He says, like a large sheet has been has been let down and come right down to me. I looked inside his sheet and I saw animals, I saw birds, I saw all kind of creatures. A voice come and told me, get up, Peter, eat. Peter's response was what? No. I'm not eating. His reply was no. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. What's happening to Peter? He's talking about the transformation in his own life, isn't he? He's talking about this transformation in his own life. We said it this morning. Your life should be a constant transformation for the glory of Christ. Look at your life spiritually speaking. Not your spouse, not your children, not your parents. But you, look at your own life. Are you transforming closer? Are you drawing closer to Christ? Are you learning more about Him? Are you learning more about what He wills for you in your life? And that's what's happening to Peter. You see, Peter's still hooked on what? The Jewish laws. He doesn't let go of it. Even after, even after Christ is crucified... It's announced that salvation is to the Jew and to the Gentile also. Again, we mentioned this this morning. There's no more need for clean and unclean animals. There's no more need for sacrifices. Still, it went on for many years after. People just refused to let go. They just refused to let go. Tradition's a killer, isn't it? Huh? A lot of churches, especially especially a lot of your smaller churches, are so run or so driven by traditional thinking. Just run by it. Amen. They're just run by traditional thinking. The sad thing is for most of your churches, there's a few, there's two or three people in a smaller church that pretty much behind the scenes call the shots. And what we think is Tradition that you know we'll claim oh it goes back to the cross. No, that tradition that we love so much is less than a hundred years old. Yeah. In yeah. most cases. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're exactly right. Amen. Justin's right. If you looked at a lot of traditions within a lot of churches today, especially your smaller church, smaller country churches, Justin's exactly right. A lot of your traditions, you can you can follow that line backwards in reverse if you will a hundred or so years he's exactly right to when they started there was nothing based on scripture go ahead David you find it you find the point of origin mm -hmm. where it yeah. originated from and if you can do it that far back you know there's something weird about it yes from with the Jewish uh, with the law it can went back thousands of years yeah so hard to get away from them because mm -hmm. see in reality when you had to bring a sacrifice that was your sacrifice mm -hmm. for you it wasn't for the whole nation the only one was the day of atonement for the yeah. whole nation yeah and they wouldn't really, I, it was hard to grasp one man which was Jesus Christ one only one gave his life for everybody, and that meant everybody, Jew and Gentile. And when they was told to go to the Gentile, that was an unheard of thing. Yeah, it was a it was it was a big change from yeah. from from Jew to Gentile, because mm -hmm. they wouldn't even walk on the same side of the street as no. the Gentile. No, no, they hated the people. They hated them. Yeah. What's the what's one of the famous stories in the Old Testament? Jonah, right? Yeah. Huh. You learn that story when you're a child in Sunday school. He'd rather die than go to, go to Nineveh. 
Yeah. He hated the people. Jonah would rather die than go to Nineveh. He would rather go on a transatlantic, if you will, boat ride in the belly of a fish than go to Nineveh. Why? Because he hated the people. He said he I hate them. He couldn't stand them. If he had it his way, he would have cast them all himself into hell. He said that. Do away with them. And yet, when he preached the gospel to them, when he preached to them that to repent, that, or the Lord's going to destroy you, and even then he went outside the city to wait for the bar ball to come. Yeah. yeah. He still hated them. Yeah. Even though he went in there and he, and he preached to them and said, Judgment's coming. And mm-hmm. it, with this instance here, even though Christ has come and bled, died, and the whole thing, they still are against the Gentiles. Yeah, exactly. At this point in time. Yeah. yeah. There's still those that are against the Gentiles. They're still against the Gentiles. They still do not see Christ in the big picture. But if you reverse all that, and it was us and it was them, we'd be the same way. If we, we was God's chosen people, we would be exactly like them. Yeah. There ain't no difference in us. No. Just third Jew were Gentile. That's it's hard to relearn, isn't it? It's hard to relearn. Well, and that's the thing. It was it was two different covenants. Yeah. They were still feeling that they were under that old covenant. Even though Christ said, you know, as we did this morning at the Lord's Supper, this is the blood of my of the new covenant. Mm-hmm. You know, these dietary laws were legitimate. They were the real deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard it said before, because Jesus never ate bacon, I get to eat bacon. And the point being, I mean, that's a funny little quip, but the the point being, because Jesus kept every single law in the Old Testament, it means that he was the sufficient sacrifice. It means that the sacrifice was accepted, that he was raised on the third day, and because he kept every law perfectly, I trust in him. It's as if I kept every And there's no need for what? Another sacrifice. Because as Justin just said, he kept it what? Perfectly. That made him to be a sacrifice. Yes. Because he kept the law. The law couldn't be kept by nobody but him. There was no need, you're exactly right, for another sacrifice. We've got the story, but they didn't. No. They didn't comprehend the depth of what was going on. No. Now we have it right before us, and we don't get it. We don't get it in its totality. Peter's going through again his testimony about what happened to the Jewish believers that are criticizing him they want to know what the heck is going on because this is totally against everything as justin just said as david said everything that they've ever believed this is going against that they don't like it they want answers and g and peter who has turned out to be a mighty fine preacher i might add He gives testimony about verse 11. Behold, immediately there's three men already are come unto the house where I was and sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send me, or send men to Joppa, call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell the words whereby thou hast and all thy house shall be saved. 
And as they began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them and on us at the beginning. So Peter goes through his little testimony. He talks about all that happened. He talks about all that were present there. He talks about how an angel had appeared to him in his home as far as Cornelius to send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. We'll tell you and everyone else in your household how to be saved. The angel tells Cornelius, he says, what? Go find Simon Peter. He's living with a, a Simon the Tanner who deals in the hides of animals. This Simon Peter is going to tell you about salvation only comes through Christ. But the, what does Peter use? The truth. Yeah. Very short and concise. The law of primacy. First thing learned, first thing retained. These Jewish law keepers are living by whose law? God's law or their law? <laughs> so yes. now we go to the Gentile. Oh, that uncircumcised slob on the side of the road. You can't even eat with that slob. Peter had forethought. He had been thinking about this. And remember, a good friend of his had told him, you always say the truth, nothing but, and you'll never have controversy. You're going to face brush yeah. fire, forest fire, everything. And look what Peter did. He, went, he, he told the Jewish council, Folks, bing, 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 bing. There it is. That's what I did. And who had told me this? The Spirit of God come to me, and the Spirit of God came to Cornelius. Now, you guys going to argue with that? They have nothing to stand on. The truth yeah. which Jesus Christ had told them all as possible, apostles, to use the truth. Paul flat put it down in his life from the conversion on. Peter was a little bit slower, but he, he's a rock, and he's as hard convicted with the truth as he'd been in confusion to learn the truth. Mm -hmm. Look what he's done. Yeah. In such short, concise, to the point. Bing, 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 bing. Here's what happened. They don't know what to do now. No. No. The law of primacy is, what, can I change? It doesn't matter. God has already told you flat-footed what will mm -hmm. be done. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. That you, you can't start a fire when you got nothing but a bucket of water. Yeah, you couldn't. There was, there was nothing to add to. Nothing. Or take away. Peter's coming around to letting them know about Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of the world, not just to the Jew, but also to the Greek, also to the Gentile. Amen. That was it. It says in verse 15, begins to speak, doesn't he, in verse 15. As he's speaking, the Holy Ghost falls on them. Just as he fell at us at the beginning. It talks about the Holy Spirit falling on the household. As he was speaking, he's giving testimony of this. And he says, then I remembered the word of the Lord and how he said, isn't this funny? At that particular time, I remembered the words of the Lord and he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. You will be given the, 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 the promised spirit will be given unto you. And it not only was given to Peter, but Peter saying it, it, it fell on Cornelius, it fell on his household, those nasty Gentiles. And since God gave these Gentiles, he says in verse 17, for as much then as God gave them the gift, the same gift as he did unto us, since he gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I stand 
who am I basically saying to stand in God's way? Amen. What was I that I could withstand God? In other words, who am I? If the Lord God wills to save a Gentile, who am I to stand in his way? Right? Amen. Hey, we're only 50, 60 years removed from the black on white racism that dominated parts of this country and there was whites that literally what believed what that a black man was what was unable to ever come to faith in the Lord Jesus we're not far away from that and we were just 50 60 years along here and it's the same thing back then but with two different groups of people, the Jew and the Gentile. Did you believe the Gentiles will never come to faith? They're, they're, they're dogs. They're dogs. They were called dogs. Not only was Peter learning all this, not only was he learning all this, but what? The, all the new believers were learning all this. Now, in verse 18, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said what? In verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. The Jewish church now acknowledges the call not just to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. Amen. And now they acknowledge it. They acknowledge that the Gentiles have been given the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life through the Lord Jesus. Remember back in chapter 10... When Peter first met Cornelius, what did Cornelius do? He falls at the feet of Peter. He pretty much grabs Peter's ankles. And Peter pretty much picks him up and says, Oh, calm down there, little man. It's not me who you're supposed to be worshiping and praising. It is the Lord Jesus, the one who I've been sent here to tell you about. He's the one that you need to worship and praise. It's him. It's Him. He's the one to worship. He's the one to praise. It's Him. In verse 19, a little interesting thing happens. Now when they were scattered abroad throughout the persecution that arose about Stephen, or Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Remember, the believers that had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled throughout many different lands. And who did they preach to? Who were they preaching to as they, as they were scattered ab abroad? They preached the word of God only to the Jews. Only to the Jews. But now it will not be long before they will hear. No, 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 no. You are not only to preach to the Jews. But you should also preach to the Gentiles too. Make a little joke about it. If Paul was telling them that, he'd probably make them turn around on a dirt road and go back and preach to the Gentiles, the ones that they, they left behind in the city. Well, then right after that, Galatians chapter 2, you know, Paul says here, now when Peter had come to Antioch, this right in the same time, I was stood into his face. Yep. Because he was to be blamed for being, for before certain men came from James, he beat with Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, 
fearing those who were of the circumcision. Yeah. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in a manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So even Peter was yeah. able to fall fall back in yeah. to the same ways just right after this. Right after this. And then you look over in chapter 15 of Acts, and what's happened? The Jerusalem Council. Peter said, nope, they don't got to be circumcised. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. We all need Paul's in our life. It's the problem. The, the issue, not the problem. The issue with having Paul's around is this, is are you mature enough, spiritually speaking, to handle him? But Paul, right here in Acts, and, and Luke has written this so well, Stephen was Paul's big downfall. Paul should have stopped this, yeah. but he's the one that truly said, go ahead. And look at the transitional parts of their lives. Paul was, was so rapid in his. Peter's a little bit slower. And Peter was more human in that he kept stumbling. But when he did become, and, and Christ knew long, that's why he inserted him as the rock. Mm -hmm. You will be the rock that's going to do. Poor little Peter didn't understand that at the time because Jesus was divinely interceding, knowing exactly what his capabilities were. Peter did not know his strengths, wasn't even aware of a few of them. Well, Paul, that's how great this book is written. It, it is, it is woven so perfectly, even the crisis of Stephen yeah. was such a monumental turning point in the apostles' work. <laughs> this, this book is ah, so strong. Yeah. You were exactly, exactly right. And he would be confronted by Paul Amen. and told the importance of getting it right. Of getting it right. And the new believers, they too would find themselves in sort of a ping pong way of living, you know, back and forth, trying to get their footings, spiritually speaking. And all of them eventually would to go on to, to be great men of the Most High God. But along the ways, it would be bumpy. It would be rocky. It would be a rocky journey along the way. But it would be all for the glory of Christ. Peter gives his testimony in Acts chapter 11 about all that happened to him with the sacrifice and that Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He gives that beautiful testimony. And just like Justin said a few minutes ago, interesting that it wasn't long after. There he is again. Finding himself sliding backwards into the muck of the ways of the world in believing. Amen. But aren't we all? Aren't we all? Hmm? That's I the mean, thing. When he was yeah. right, he was a child of God. Yeah. But 
But guess what? When he was wrong, he was still trying to get Yeah, yeah. Man. you're exactly right. But Peter had to learn like we all do. Mm -hmm. We all have to learn. You ain't gonna learn by sitting on your butt and not doing nothing. No. You, if you ain't moving, you, if you ain't moving from the Lord, you ain't going to do anything. A lot of people look at leaving from the Lord, you got to do something big. No, it's just a matter of putting one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. It ain't about a matter of how big you are or how much you do. Just put one foot in front of the other from a day and day to day living. Yeah. I won't be going a lot of places where other people go. It ain't meant for me to be. If it was, I'd be there. But the point about it is to put one foot in front of the other for the Lord and let it go. Get mm -hmm. back here the rest of it. And that's easy to say sitting here. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say it, but it's something else to do it that on a daily basis. Going to work and everything looks the same over and over. Yeah, because you got to understand that it wasn't long after. If you, I know we won't get into there tonight, but in Acts chapter twelve, you got King King Herod Agrippa's coming onto the scene, pretty heavy, and he's going to start doing some serious persecution of the church, and James is going to have his head cut off. Now, if anything's going to change the mind of a few people, it's watching your friend's head roll down the street, and that's what the plan was by Herod Agrippa was to strike fear in these believers and get them to shut up about the Lord Jesus. But he didn't realize that greater is he that lives within us than he that is in the world. He didn't know and understand that. And that's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 12. But that takes us up to that point in Acts chapter 12 and you you seen from this morning into this evening. I know we kind of did a pretty quick movement movement through 10 and 11 of acts but how it, how it tied a little bit you know you see where peter was gripping to because we were in leviticus for a few weeks you see what peter was gripping to back in leviticus and that old sacrificial system and what you can do and what you can't do and how christ comes along and just shatters that and he's the ultimate sacrifice there's no need for another he is the ultimate sacrifice for man it's Christ and Christ alone and that's where not just Peter not just James not just Paul but all those would proclaim from is that podium of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone they would do it for his glory in his glory alone. anybody else have anything Lee, you want to close us this evening, brother? Father, we just thank you for your word and thank you that you use it to strengthen us and help us learn more about you. Give us your peace and joy in times of trouble. Father, we thank you that you're there teaching us any time we're going to be taught. Father, give us your strength to do your will. Amen. Mm -hmm.